Hello, welcome to this PCR webinar entitled When and How Should I Treat a Calcific Coronary Stenosis with Orbital Atherectomy? My name is Javier Escanet, and I have the pleasure and the privilege to be with two colleagues and friends, Dr. Miroslav Ferenc and Dr. Jackson Muxil. Hello. Hi. Hello. We have put together a session today to discuss with you a new technique that is uh, orbital atherectomy, a technique that has joined the portfolio of techniques we have in our shelves, on our shelves, to treat calcific stenosis during PCI. Orbital atherectomy has been available to American colleagues now for years, but we now in Europe and other parts of the world, we have the opportunity to bring this to treat our patients. So with this in mind, we set uh, as uh, our objectives for this webinar to understand uh, the mechanism of uh, the advantages of calcific plaque reparation with the CSI orbital atherectomy system to learn, to learn clearly aspects of the practical use of orbital atherectomy uh, through the revision being a, witnessing a, a recorded live case and to revisit updated evidence supporting the safety and effectiveness of orbital atherectomy in clinical practice. And uh, we hope that you enjoy this uh, webinar. We really look forward to your engagement. You can please put to us questions and comments uh, and we will, in that way, we will get uh, most of the, out of it. And with this, I would like to uh, ask uh, my colleague, uh, Miroslav Ferenc, to first uh, revisit for us uh, the technical aspects of uh, orbital atherectomy. Miroslav is uh, one of the persons who has more experience in orbital atherectomy in Europe, so I'm sure that we are going to learn very practical tips and tricks uh, from his talk. Thank you, Miroslav. Yeah, dear Javier, thank you for this uh, kind introduction, dear colleagues. So we uh, we can be really happy to have one more tool to approach um, calcific coronary uh, lesions. And uh, there is a really interesting mechanism of action uh, if you uh, plan to use orbital atherectomy system. So we have, first of all, the option to make, a, to perform uh, with um, crown, which is uh, 1.25 millimeter in diameter. So with this crown, we can make we can make atherectomy using sending maneuver, and then we win around 2.5 up to even four millimeters. So we can make a very nice tube channel. Then uh, can a next step we can you can you can approach even with um, uh, larger balloons and then you can stand um, perform standing adequately and uh, one more option is as you can see uh, in this uh, lower uh, picture there is also option to perform plug uh, modification so there is a deep action and if you just uh, see the OCT picture in the corner there is uh, and we I can I can um, uh, tell you I saw this many times um, in our cath lab you make a partial fractioning of of uh, this uh, calcific uh, plugs and, and then um, the next step you can uh, uh, perform prodilatation and, and stenting maneuver um, so, and this is uh, what what you need. You need um, the um, uh, pump. You need the um, device. Uh, on the end is the crown. You need some fluid uh, lubricant, which is uh, used uh, for uh, glycolysis. So you can go with low speed, very easy um, with uh, crown um, um, to to the vessel in the guiding and, and finally i think um, this is also one point for discussion later on there is also a new viper wire uh, which is over three meters long and uh, with excellent uh, qualities and this is again the uh, pump and this is a lubricant you have to ask people patients according to the possible allergy uh, soya allergy or protein allergy and this is obligatory point. So you need this um, uh, fluid in, for um, infusion. 
So, and this is, uh, as I mentioned before, this is now um, this very elegant Viper wire and uh, quite unique. This is the first uh, on the Nitinol care coronary atherectomy wire with excellent torque quality. So I can, I can believe me, I have done uh, now around 50 uh, cases with orbital atherectomy. And I was always um, really surprised how easy uh, the cross with this wire is. And um, it's really, in next um, video, we can uh, just um, show um, how, how to approach. This is um, now really nicely shown how easy uh, the crossing, um, even of calcified trutius, uh, coronaris is and here's an example from Jacques uh, Cathlab um, how to how to approach and um, so we will see uh, even this slide um, this uh, movie uh, later on. So um, the device is uh, quite easy and you use only electric power to to um, go ahead and uh, you have your wire connections so uh, you have connection to the uh, crown, so there is everything in set. And this green button here, uh, if you press down, so you activate the system. And if you go forward, uh, you can uh, just um, go forward. And if you go bar backwards, so the crown is going back. And here on the right side, you have um, here um, Three options to go with a standard speed. Uh, it's 80,000 in the middle, 120,000 speed. And um, here, the green button, you just have a break for the wire. You just press down and um, that's, um, that's it. Yeah, here you can see the crown uh, in the middle and you can you have a huge benefit and advantage. Um, if you go forward, you make ablation. If you go backwards, you um, um, approach with ablation and sending of the plug material. And uh, as you can see, this could be in some cases also a point that if there is really uncrossable lesion, so this could could lead um, to, could make some problems, but this is really rare. Um, we could uh, cross practically in, in all cases uh, with um, this crown. And if we go ahead, um, so you can see here, next slide. Next slide, please. So the, the main contraindication uh, is um, thrombus, uh, dissection, um, Maybe if there is a um, stand in the target lesion, grafted vessels um, and uh, one open vessel, um, I think um, today's uh, we have, of course, option to perform such case, cases using uh, impeller protection. So this will be no no problem for me. So we have done a few such cases in our cat lab. And uh, what can occur if you go even very gently, of course, there is still option to, to have some uh, dissection, sometimes even flow um, uh, limiting dissection. Perforation is extremely uh, rare and slow flow um, the same, extremely rare um, case. So how to approach? So uh, I think another very important and relevant advantage is you can use uh, the system very nicely if you go with six French guiding cathedral. Um, so even in majority of cases, we, we approach our uh, coronaris using um, six uh, French guiding using radial approach. So uh, you can go at ad hoc uh, with um, orbital uh, atherectomy system. So Viper wire is very uh, good sterile and if you need even after um, the procedure, if you need uh, more backup or more extra support qualities, then you have to exchange. Um, and uh, finally, um, there is um, a chrome motion. Um, you have two speeds and a very important point is you need uh, to be a patient. So you have to go really very slowly and one millimeter per second, take your time 
and you go with run one. Run one is around approximately 25 seconds. There was acoustic sound. Then you have to stop again for around 25 seconds. And um, you can hear sometimes uh, the, the choice, uh, the change in noise um, if you approach really very, very calcified and subtotal lesion. And um, so this is, um, I think, um, one of the uh, most important points um, that you have option to go forward, go backwards, and you make still significant ablation. The risk to stuck with this system is minimal. We, we Now we have around 80 cases in our cath lab, so there was no no one case uh, with uh, birth stuck or crown stuck. And this is um, one, I think, important point. And uh, another important point is uh, to the use imaging. We will um, point out this point, uh, this topic in discussion. And after orbital atherectomy approach, it's really um, easy to go forward with balloon. And we usually go with 10, 12, 14 atmospheres and we we see what, what, what will happen sometimes, sometimes in some cases, on top, you can also use a uh, shockwave balloon to prepare lesion more adequately. But definitely for that, you will have a um, very nice uh, channel. So this is, I think, from my point of view, uh, most important uh, points to approach to use uh, the system. And um, it's, it's really safe and um, doing really great job. And what is really, from my point of view, also important, it, you don't have um, big bradycardia problems. So we usually don't give um, don't give atropine um, in our patients. And uh, there is no problem problem with uh, high hypertension because there is still, if you ablate, there is still some um, uh, uh, residual flow in coronaries. And also, from my point of view, um, very important topic in in um, daily routine. Okay, so um, this will be um, from my point um, from most important points uh, in, in in daily routine. Okay, I give back to Javier. Thank you, Emilio's lab. I mean, that's a, a great um, technical review of uh, orbital atherectomy. Uh, I guess that most colleagues uh, envisage or orbital atherectomy as something that is close to rotational atherectomy. Intuitively, these are the techniques that are more similar. But I'm sure that there are important differences that should be highlighted. Jax, would you like to address that particular topic? What are the main differences between uh, rotational atherectomy and orbital atherectomy? Thank you, uh, Javier, and uh, thank you, Miroslav, for this uh, first part. So uh, there is a great differences uh, between uh, atherectomy uh, devices uh, comparing orbital and uh, rotational. You see, uh, in terms of uh, mechanisms of action, it's totally different. Uh, with the orbital, we uh, perform a sending with a, a double action with bidirectional uh, treatment, anterograd and retrograd. And we have the second action with a pulsatile force, which cracks the lesion. This is very important. We, we thought that with the uh, uh, in my, in endovascular imaging, we, we, we see the fracture. Of course, with uh, rotablation, we have an action just in front of cutting and only unidirectional treatment. The second difference is uh, the device size. Of course, only one size with orbital, very simple. You can work with uh, usually six French. All the, all the lesion uh, could be be treated with a six French guiding. It's totally different with uh, rotational with several sizes of burr. And it's uh, generally, if you want to use a very large burr, it's necessary to, to use a seven or eight French. The device action is, uh, of course, uh, different because with a hobital is a 360 degree cron approach. So uh, it, it's a, a setting just around uh, the vessel we have an action outside of the, the wall and inside of the curve of the wall, totally different with the, rota the rotablation. 
the vessel size that you can treat, uh, as uh, Miros had mentioned that previously, from 2.5 to 4 millimeter vessel uh, with orbital. And of course, uh, in rotational atherectomy, it's adapted to the burst size. The speed, only two speeds uh, with orbital, uh, 80,000 and uh, 120,000, according to the size of the vessel, the flow. Uh, this, this is, I think it's very important because with the orbital, we have a continuous flow during uh, the device action. Uh, and in comparison to the rotational atherectomy, well, we have no flow. And probably that's explained why we have more and more um, slow flow or no flow with rotablation in comparison to orbital. Uh, the wire. Uh, you, you see that it's uh, for orbital, it's a 0 0.12 uh, inch uh, wire with a nitinol core, very easy to manipulate. Of course, the support is not, it's, it's not very well, but to uh, navigate is very, heal, very easy. Uh, the great difference between the, uh, the rotor wire. The pump difference, uh, one is electrical for orbital and the pressure gas with uh, rotablation and we it's necessary to use a lubricant specific device for orbital and non-specific lubricant for uh, rotational atherectomy. So I think you you, you see uh, th there is really a great difference, uh, a totally different approach of uh, calcified lesion uh, between the, the, the two devices. So Javier, uh, perhaps we have uh, some questions from uh, audience, and we can try to uh, answer to these questions. Absolutely, absolutely. And we have many colleagues uh, joining from many different parts of the world, from Vietnam, from Bangladesh, India, Poland, Kosovo, many places. So um, there's one of the questions that is, is put to us by a colleague is, uh, perhaps Miroslav, you can comment about this. Is there any risk of entrapment of the system? Can the orbital atherectomy system become uh, stuck? in the lesion, and I don't know if you had any experience like that, and perhaps you can share also any tips and tricks in case that this might happen. So from my point of view, if you approach um, very gently, and if you go with um, uh, with your movement speed, uh, one millimeter per, per second, um, then it's practically really impossible to, to, to stack. So even uh, we cross it a few times, completely un uncrossable lesions and tortuous vessels. And so I never, I never, if I'm going uh, very gently um, using one milli millimeters uh, per second speed, I, I didn't have any problems with um, uh, to, to move back uh, the system. So this is, um, this is, I think the, Big, much more bigger problem is uh, you could uh, make a jump with a uh, with a crown. Um, this is um, maybe more often uh, than than to stack. So I, I never had this um, experience. So in, in our center, we we have now done around eighty cases. No such case uh, to see, and we have really many pay difficult cases and just transferred from other hospitals. Uh, so we we. I can't tell you at the moment, I don't have any experience regarding this point. So, but it is normally maybe possible, but uh, I think from my point, this is even advantage. Uh, this is definitely safer than, than uh, burrs to go to, to go with burr and to stuck in, in some uh, um, tortuous uh, vessel. So I had such, um, such complication uh, last year with uh, Rotam. One of the reasons that that is less likely to occur is because first you are operating on a larger orbit, so it is more difficult to get stuck. And the second one is because at the difference with uh, rotational atherectomy, you can, you can cut uh, uh, backwards. So you open your way back, something that of course will not happen with uh, orbital atherectomy. Uh, Jax, 
Nodular calcium, the nodules of calcium are a big challenge. Uh, sometimes when we perform a rotational thelectomy, we see that there is a bias of the burr or even the wire, and we are not able to approach this. Can you comment if this technique has a particular, say, value in, in, in lesions that, are, that have nodular calcium? Yes, I have a few experience uh, with uh, such uh, nodule, uh, calcified nodule, uh, but uh, it, it would be uh, possible to, to cross uh, or, or always the same uh, key message. Uh, you have to advance very, very slowly. Take time, just you, you, are, you are really sending the, the vessel. You are, you are not... Uh, uh, going through the lesion, you are sending the lesion. So take time, and uh, generally uh, you, you can treat uh, calcified uh, nodula uh, without uh, any any problem. Sometimes it's, we, we, we have, if the vessel is very, very big, of course you have to start with a low speed motion, and after that you, you pull back the system with uh, high speed uh, motion and speed and it's it's uh, gener generally it's possible without uh, any problem so we got very interesting questions regarding the use of orbital atherectomy in tortuous vessels in situations where you cannot cross with the balloon and i think that we will have the possibility to address uh, those questions after perhaps uh, seeing how a orbital atherectomy is used in clinical practice and for that, uh, Jax, I would like to invite you to share with us uh, one of your cases and, and perhaps, you know, illustrate it with uh, tips and tricks that you find uh, of interest. Yes. Thank you. So uh, in, in, in the real world, uh, what happened in, in practice? So uh, we propose a case today. It's a uh, old man, uh, 85 years old man with a prior inferior macular infarction with very large inferior wall acnesia. It was admitted for rest angina. And uh, on the angiogram, we have a chronic uh, RCA occlusion without uh, viability. Uh, and on the left uh, system, you see a very long, very heavy calcified uh, LED lesion with a double bifurcation uh, with the septal one and the diagonal branch. It's a very uh, uh, tortuous vessel also. And uh, for all this reason, we uh, decide to prepare this lesion with a uh, orbital atherectomy device. Uh, we decide to uh, protect uh, with the wire the diagonal uh, side branch uh, and finally to uh, implant a stent uh, with a provisional uh, stenting of the LED. Um, our techniques, we use uh, six French right uh, radial access as, as usually, EBU 3.5 guiding catheter, uh, we try to, um, to cross the lesion directly with the Viper wire because it's very fantastic uh, wire just to uh, navigate. Of course, the Diamondback uh, 360 provisional stent strategy after uh, orbital and predilatation. And uh, we, uh, we do a final endovascular imaging evaluation with IVUS uh, we don't do that in routine, but for this case and for the educational uh, procedure, we decide to use uh, intravascular uh, um, imaging. So I think we can go to the cat lab uh, and, uh, and to, to see uh, what we, we have done. E e calcified lesion uh, uh, from all... All the, all the LED uh, segment, uh, and uh, this for this reason that we decide uh, to prepare uh, the patient with uh, atherectomy. And maybe second point, uh, the tortuosity and uh, the fact that the calcium is at the top wall and the bottom wall and in the convexity or the concavity. So maybe the orbital is a better choice uh, because you can um, send the lesion forward and backward, forward for the top of the wall, backward for the, the, the bottom of the wall. And uh, that's a good choice, I think. And on the top of that, 
the, the calcium involved the bifurcation. So it's a good uh, choice to prepare the bifurcation and to keep the treatment as simple as possible. I spoke about the specific uh, wire, the Viper wire advance. It's a nitinol core wire, so it's easy to shape and a good uh, memory with a double curve shape, which uh, to me allow to perform 99% of uh, lesion, bifurcation lesion extra. So I spin, I drill the, the wire. Here we are probably in the septal and I drill it not in the diagonal, but in the LAD. So it crosses very easily, no friction. It, it's flying to the distal LAD, which is also tortuous. Anyway, we are far enough yeah. because we have to be uh, at least uh, two centimeters, no, uh, five millimeters from the crown. Okay. Uh, the pump provides uh, to uh, flush the system with uh, lubricant, lubricant uh, associated uh, soybean oil, um, egg uh, phospholipid, uh, glycerin, and uh, saline solution. So you can activate the system and uh, press the blue uh, button to flush the system. The system with the first uh, knob uh, uh, allowing to uh, power the system on off and also to uh, advance uh, the crown. As you see, the travel uh, uh, axis travel is uh, seven point uh, five uh, centimeter so you so, can treat long lesion with that yes on the distal part of the system you have two buttons the first one for the low speed uh, of the system uh, 80 uh, thousand uh, rpm and uh, the second one for the high speed system uh, 120 uh, rpm and here you have also the button for the flush the same one as uh, on the pump and the point very important is uh, uh, this target this target is uh, the brake is a wire brake and uh, when we are going to uh, uh, to rotate with the uh, orbital athletectomy, uh, we uh, break the system in this position. So Jacques, to summarize, you have one low speed button for starting the procedure yes. and small vessel, and the second button for large vessel or increase uh, the sending of your artery in case of larger vessel. Yes, very important. So when we start the device, we always start with uh, uh, low speed. And the low speed uh, allows to treat vessel from 2.5 millimeter to 3.5 millimeter. And the high speed, uh, um, the high speed uh, allows to treat uh, uh, 3.0 millimeter uh, vessel to 4.0 millimeter vessel. But remember, we always start with the low speed. This is really important. Okay. Before to start uh, the procedure, we are going to test uh, the system. Um, so first, I break uh, the wire, and I'm going to push on the bottom just to activate uh, the crown. So it works uh, very well. So uh, we can uh, advance uh, the system. I pull back the, the brake. And Benjamin, okay. you can advance the crown. So you have to keep the device as straight as possible to limit the friction. You see, we feel confident with the wire. Just a small scopy. We have the crown at the ostium of the LAD, as you can appreciate, and we are a bit stuck in the LAD. So we're going to make uh, uh, a part of the glide assist. 
So Jacques is going to uh, press the button to be in Glide Assist, and we're going to advance under Glide Assist. OK, activate, please. And so uh, we have a, a good backup and Fluoro store. Yeah. So you see the, the, the crone just jumped J jump. into the proximal lady. And we are very in a good position, yeah, good position. To, uh, to, to start the atherectomy. So we are moving now to the low speed uh, activation. Mm -hmm. We are ready. So the brake is on. Uh, and now I'm going to uh, start uh, the procedure of uh, atherectomy. So I press the button. OK, go. So third run, here in, the, in this curvature at the level of the bifurcation. I think it's the, the level of uh, resistance. Yeah. OK, okay just cross. I cross. Okay. We hear the sounds changing yeah. when you're pulling back. OK. So we have worked by anterograde uh, motion. Mm -hmm. Now we cross the lesion. So now we are going to work mm -hmm. uh, retrograde mm -hmm. uh, approach yeah. uh, with, the, uh, with the crone. So this is a okay. Go. This is another advantage to uh, have a bidirectional hatterectomy, and this is also an important difference between rotational and orbital hatterectomy, is that you are sending uh, the uh, eccentric part of the wall in antegrade and concentric part on retrograde, top wall and bottom yes. of the wall. So here, okay. Hear the beep and stop. We did the uh, five run, and uh, the last one is maybe uh, with higher speed, Jack. Yes, in just in the proximal yeah. part uh, of the LED. Okay. Okay. So ready. So you push I press on the button to move on the very high speed uh, and a, a very uh, quick run. Uh, So 120,000 RPM, it's for larger vessel and uh, more debulking. So very slow motion, still very slow and cautious. So then Jacques going to release the brake and also going to press a long press on the low speed button until it's, it blink. And as soon as it's blinking, everything is ready to... Uh, Pull back. Pull back the device. So push the button, the nub. Let's go again. Push. Okay. So absolutely no sound. So this is the NGO after uh, pre-dilatation, yeah. semi-compliant and NC balloon. It's quite a good result. We have good flow in both branches. So we are quite happy with that. And um, But uh, the ostium of the diagonal is a bit diseased. So here we are with a 2 millimeters by 12 millimeters NC balloon. Just a... Eight, ten. Yeah. Short inflation, uh, long inflation, yeah. but uh, low atmosphere, ten atmosphere, in order to try to not to uh, dissect this branch, to keep it uh, as simple as possible and decrease slowly, yeah. maybe. Oh, That's nice. correct. Yeah. Excellent. So we have decided to uh, implant uh, a long stent uh, 40 millimeter, 2.5 millimeter uh, diameter, uh, according to the uh, distal landing zone. Okay, perfect. Bon. 
slow in, slow in fashion always. 10, 12 atmosphere. So no waste on the distal yeah. part. And we're going to do a pot with a yeah. NC balloon. So back to finalize this um, post dilatation with a 3.5 NC balloon, high atmosphere, 20 atmosphere. We're going to pull back here. Okay, go. We're also going to zoom it in order to increase stent. Uh, Yes. Go. Okay. Go. Twenty. Okay. So this is after our stenting. The stent looks fine. The diagonal ostium is a bit aziness, yeah. but it's a very patent yeah. Timmy three flow. We're gonna check it with the IVUS. So we just perform the IVUS. Examination, we are in the distal LED and you can appreciate here uh, the distal lesion that we saw on the angio, the uh, aziness lesion. We are entering in the stent, which is quite well uh, deployed, well opposed. No stent malaposition or under expansion so far. We are approaching the diagonal branch, I hope. Uh, this is a calcified arc at uh, one o'clock. This is the diagonal branch, which is coming here on the screen. Always the calcified arc, one, more than uh, 180 degrees here on the left-hand side. Very circular, quite superficial with a nice reverberation. And this is the proximal LED and, yeah. the, and the left main. So interestingly, so we saw that the distal lesion is a, a real lesion. There is no dissection, but uh, the MLA was uh, calculated at uh, 2.6 uh, on the distal part, if I remember. Yeah, 2.6 millimeter square. So we decide to uh, to treat this lesion with a focal uh, stenting. Okay, right, seems to be good. Okay. Yeah. Off. So the LED is uh, very nice. nice. Just the question about the Put diagonal. The diagonal. Okay, it's not eight uh, atmosphere. Okay, eight atmosphere on both balloons. Yeah, it's very nice. Yeah, it's That's very right. nice. So. Yeah. We have shown uh, on the hives that uh, uh, the stent uh, on the LED is well opposed. As you see with the orbital uh, device, uh, the most important uh, key message is to send very slowly. So I think in that case, Jacques, uh, we highlighted the advantage of this device uh, with orbital, which is bidirectional atherectomy, back and forth movement. We have the 360 sending, which is important in that case, upper part, lower part. And we also have pulsatile forces that can modify the plaque in depthness. OK, thank you. And the final result, Anjo, is really perfect mm. with a Timmy free flow on the both branch. Yeah. So thank you, Benjamin. case uh, Jackson and, and really really educational in many in many aspects now uh, I can tell you that it has triggered a lot of interest uh, among the colleagues uh, we have lots of questions so I'm going to ask you to be snappy and to be concise so we can address as many as possible so uh, the first one is uh, regarding the use of wires in case that you have a side branch there is one colleague who asks if you can keep one wire in the side branch. Um, Jacques, you want to address that? No, it's impossible. So it's like with the rotation. Uh, only uh, one wire, it's impossible to, to put the end of the one. 
But the good thing is that uh, typically you do not have occlusion of uh, side branches with uh, these uh, techniques. Uh, regarding wires, um, Miroslav, you spoke highly about the Viper wire. Have you ever had any, any wire break? Uh, no, we, we didn't have any wire break, but um, I uh, remove, um, in few cases, I have to remove um, to remove uh, Viper wire and um, use instead of Viper wire some some Grand Slam or whatever some access support wire. Um, if there is a really very difficult access and um, um, vessel is very dirty, so then I usually perform this uh, change uh, using micro cathedral, not to not to lose um, the wire position. But um, if you have quite simple way and um, simple non tortuous uh, segment to treat, then you can go um, with um, with wiper wire with stand, uh, standing approach. Uh, also, you can cut uh, similar to, to rotor wire, you can cut this wire to, to make procedure easier. It's working. Very good. Um, osteal right coronary artery, osteal left main, uh, Jax. Is this uh, something that you can address with orbital atherectomy or any considerations? Yes, yeah, yes, it's a possibility to, to, to treat osteal lesion. Nevertheless, uh, we privilege to, to treat uh, backward with the, uh, with the system and not anterograde uh, approach. So, uh, yes, it's possible, uh, but mandatory to use uh, only uh, retrograde uh, uh, sanding. It's more more easy and more uh, safe for, for the patient. Very good. Um, stenting in tortuous vessels, well, sorry, sanding in tortuous vessels, when you're performing orbital atherectomy in tortuous vessels. Miroslav, what will be your, your, your key messages? I think, uh, as uh, Jacques mentioned, go very gently, very slow. Never start to to go uh, primary with uh, high speed. I mean, with one hundred twenty thousand. So always go with start with with eighty. Go very gently. Sometimes you have to spend a uh, really few minutes to to approach the lesion. But um, on the other hand, if you approach, there is practically zero chance to stuck with uh, this crown. And um, I think if you have tortuous vessels, um, you have to be even slower than, than you believe because then you could have a jump. I had a few times some jump and uh, one time with the section and what it was initial uh, start in February when we started our cases, what what you if you if you see there is a jump, please stop and go very gently back. Even if you if you can go with a uh, glide assist back, make gentle injection because if you ablate more and more, then you can uh, even uh, make this dissection and maybe no flow phenomenon uh, much larger and bigger, then, then you could have really a problem. So uh, start gently if you see the, the jump, uh, make injection, don't don't uh, ablate anymore, just make a break, make injection. Uh, if the flow is uh, perfect, okay, then you can go back. Um, and uh, as Jacques mentioned, if you go back, you also very perform very effective uh, ablation uh, sending. Yeah. So that's, that is, uh, I believe that we should stop at that point. That is a very important safety message because of the difference of action with rotational atherectomy. If for whatever reason you have your, your your crown has moved very quickly, do not insist in sanding before you make sure that you have not generated a dissection. Because sanding in the presence of a dissection can be dangerous. Is that is that correct? My interpretation. Absolutely correct, uh, and and uh, that's why I know now for my own. Uh, case and uh, I think I now I can avoid uh, such complication in the future. Now, uh, Jax, uh, one of the specific features of this device is that you can uh, sand uh, retrograde or, or backwards, if you wish. When do you consider this from the very beginning? When do you consider that um, you are not going to perform anti-grade ablation, but you are going to perform retrograde ablation? Could you give us any examples? Yes, I, I, 
generally I use the, I prefer, preferably I, I use the anterograde approach. But uh, keep in mind that when you, uh, you are in anterograde approach, you sand uh, the top of the wall uh, with privilege. And when you, 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 you have the retrograde approach, uh, the sanding is uh, on, on the bottom of the, of the wall of the vessel. So uh, I think it's very important to use uh, anterograde and also retrograde. But in my experience, I prefer to use the anterograde approach, uh, probably because uh, we have we have learned we, with the retabulation system and and we, and we work only in anterograde approach. And it's totally different now with this uh, new device uh, to to work uh, in in, in uh, bidirectional uh, motion. So and of course for the osteolation for the osteolation. We, we work uh, with privilege in, uh, in forward uh, motion. Same question to you, Miroslav. I mean, yeah. uh, any situation where you consider from the very beginning or the, the, start, uh, the start approach to be retrograde? Um, normally, you have to cross first the lesion anterograde, definitely. And if you're behind the lesion, what we do if there is a vessel diameter um, around 3.5 and really subtotal lesion, and then uh, what I do, and I can recommend you this as a safe approach, then I'm increasing the speed to 120,000. And um, if I'm going retrograde, then I'm using in large vessels, of course, not, not below um, 3.0, over 3.0 diameter, then um, this is also very potent uh, and very um, significant um, way to, to um, make uh, significant ablation. So that, that's, this is what, what I'm using in daily routine. Thank you. Now, there's another question that actually you probably uh, answered to it uh, over the live case, uh, Jax, is um, when should you move to 120 RPM? And you mentioned before that, uh, of course, you even if you are working in a large vessel, you should always start perform by performing a low speed uh, ablation and then a high speed ablation. But can you expand a bit on the use of 120 RPM uh, ablation. Yes, when, when the vessel is very large and when there is a, a, a very heavy calcified lesion with uh, uh, important uh, calcification in the media of the vessel and very large vessel, uh, we recommend to finish uh, the, the orbital with uh, high speed motion. But um, in a large majority of my experience, uh, we perform only with a low uh, speed. And uh, what is important in the, is the duration of uh, uh, the sanding. Take time. And uh, uh, generally, we, 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 we perform uh, around three or four minutes of sanding uh, per uh, procedure. So I, I think it's more important to, uh, to use low speed, but in a long duration, uh, in comparison to a very high speed, uh, uh, except very large vessel. So, Jack, uh, I think that we have also some questions regarding um, scientific evidence. And I think for that reason, perhaps we can move uh, to the final track of our webinar and uh, you could revisit uh, what uh, is the scientific evidence supporting the use of uh, orbital atherectomy. Thank you. Okay. Okay, Javier, we, we, we finished with that, uh, the scientific evidence. Uh, uh, of course, we have a very... Um, Poor result because because it's a, it's a new techniques. This is uh, orbit one is a is a first uh, non randomized uh, uh, study. It's a prospective study. Only uh, fifty uh, uh, patient with uh, of course uh, very calcified lesion with a, a low uh, a rate of uh, mace. And you see the follow up five years of follow up. Uh, we have on, on only twenty percent of mace. Uh, poor uh, cardiac death also and poor uh, 
TLR. Uh, more interesting is uh, our B2 uh, um, study, the prospective multicenter single harm study, more than uh, 400 uh, patients uh, and uh, two uh, primary endpoints. The first, uh, safety with uh, one month mace, and uh, the second uh, endpoint is efficacy uh, endpoint with a procedural success. Uh, um, what we see uh, on the result, uh, you see the, the MACE, uh, 30 days uh, rate with a very low uh, microdata infraction uh, and uh, a Q wave infraction very, very low, less than 1%. The TVR, TLR, very low, 1.4%, and uh, cardiac death, 0.2%. The performance. Uh, uh, predefined uh, of uh, during for, for this uh, study was 83 percent and uh, the freedom from uh, uh, one one month mace uh, is obtained in uh, nearly 90 uh, percent of cases procedural success component is the same result very, with very nice uh, result of course a uh, few and geographic complication with uh, dissection, a few perforation, slow flow or uh, no flow. Nevertheless, uh, it was uh, uh, the beginning of uh, the adventure. And uh, now this uh, rate of complication is uh, uh, very, uh, very low. Uh, next, please. Uh, Uh, the follow-up was uh, very nice uh, with uh, two years and three years follow-up in, in this uh, OB2 study with uh, uh, a rate of MACE, uh, 23%. It's, it's not really very important because it's a really a very complex lesion. So, uh, of course, uh, the rate of MACE is more important. Uh, interesting, the uh, first uh, third um, uh, studies um, this uh, multicenter registry. It's a real world approach, uh, and you see that the angiographic complications are very, very, uh, very low, uh, less than 1%, and the safety uh, and the efficacy is very, very uh, interesting with a, a poor uh, rate of, uh, of maze, of, of, of course, of stroke. Uh, uh, and now we are waiting for uh, the future the eclipse trial. It's a randomized um, study comparing our bipolar athletic strategy to conventional enterprise strategy. And uh, we are waiting for the result. Probably uh, uh, next year we have the result of this, uh, uh, this uh, study. So you see um, the, the literature is uh, very uh, interesting. We have a very safe device, efficient uh, device. Uh, of course, there is a learning curve at the beginning. Uh, you, you cannot do, uh, if you want, tomorrow uh, an orbital atherectomy because there is a learning curve with a process with CSI. We have, you have to validate uh, uh, six patients with uh, control uh, monitoring. And after that, you you, you can uh, do uh, alone uh, the, uh, the 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 orbital atherectomy. Yeah, I mean, so uh, we have a few few times to few questions. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, first, a comment. I think that obviously it is clear that we are speaking of a subset of patients in which um, in whom uh, PCI has a high risk than in conventional, uh, say, PCI procedures. Uh, and that explains, of course, that there is a, a number of cases where we have the, the type of complications that you mentioned there. I think that it's important to keep this in mind. There was one colleague who was asking if, um, if there is in the pipeline any head-to-head -head comparison between orbital atherectomy and rotational atherectomy. Are you aware of any study of that kind, uh, Jax? Yes, we, we, we have a few data in, in the literature with, uh, of course, retrospective, uh, non-randomized uh, study. And we, we, we have uh, the, really the, the, the same result, except uh, in the duration we have uh, less uh, TLR uh, with uh, orbital atherectomy, and uh, we, we decrease 
and um, the quantity of uh, iodine uh, of dye. And of course, we reduce also uh, the duration of fluoroscopy. But nevertheless, there is not uh, uh, a big uh, uh, study comparing uh, the two systems uh, prospectively. So it's only a retrospective approach. Well, I think that that's, uh, that's, that's clear, but I think it's obviously great to have all these uh, evidence supporting the safety and efficacy of orbital atherectomy. As we mentioned before, the technique has been available for the, the colleagues in the U.S. Uh, for, for a time. And we, in many occasions, we, we attended, of course, uh, live case transmissions and, and procedures that were treated with this technique. Um, as, uh, as mentioned, and I'm, I'm sure that most of the colleagues uh, know that, it is now available in Europe and also in Asia and other parts of the world. And I'm sure that over the next um, years, we are going to see um, tremendous advancement in the uh, feedback on the practical use of the technique. So we think, with this, I think uh, that we are approaching uh, the end of our webinar and probably we could just um, discuss uh, some take home messages that I have gathered based on all that we have discussed. I think it is clear that the, the orbital atherectomy system is, is a valuable tool in performing calcific plaque preparation during BCI. Uh, JAX, the evidence that you review uh, with us is supporting this statement and I think that uh, the, the comments that um, Miroslav, also you made about your patients is, is very positive regarding the, the, the value of uh, orbital atherectomy in clinical practice. Uh, we also learned that the, there's a unique mechanism of action uh, related to orbital atherectomy, that is uh, forward and backward plaque uh, modification. And that also um, there is an associated ease of use of the system because you only need a, one single crown size to perform um, ablation in a small and large vessels. Um, you revisit uh, very nicely all the evidence that has been accumulated so far, Jax, uh, regarding the, the, the studies performed on, on orbital atherectomy, particularly orbit one and orbit two. It is very interesting to see these real-life registries that provide us a perspective less biased than clinical trials that typically have very strict inclusion and exclusion criteria. And with this, um, I would like to uh, basically say thank you uh, to you, uh, Miroslav and Jax. It's, it's been a pleasure to prepare together this, um, this webinar. Thank you very much to all the colleagues that have joined the webinar for their comments, uh, stimulating questions. I think that that con has contributed a lot to uh, perform an in-depth uh, discussion on this um, important um, technique of plaque modification. Thank you to the PCR webinar crew that has been supporting us in the preparation and the transmission of this webinar. And of course, uh, thanks to uh, CSI, for an unrestricted grant that made possible uh, having this uh, webinar. With this, uh, we say bye to you. Uh, stay in tune. Keep um, aligned with uh, the upcoming PCR webinars. There will be more on this and other very important topics in interventional cardiology. Stay safe. Bye. Okay, thank bye. you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you.